Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to kind of wrap up this giant topic, reactions of alkylides. We saw a total of four mechanisms up to this point uh, for substitutions, SN1 and SN2, for eliminations, E1 and E2. How do we look at a reaction um, you know, from that perspective and consider all four mechanisms and decide which one is going to predominate? So that's what we're looking at here, substitution versus elimination, picking out one of those four mechanisms and then um, also taking a look at synthetic strategies, how we can apply those reactions to uh, to synthesizing a given target molecule. Okay, so the, you know the first big decision we need to make is: Are we looking at uh, something that is going to be a bimolecular reaction or a unimolecular reaction? Because that's really where our competition lies. So if it is bimolecular, what what does that mean? That means we have two things coming together in our rate determining step um, or one step mechanism with two things coming together. So for example, SN2, what does SN2 mean? Backside attack, backside attack. So that's where we had a strong nucleophile, a strong nucleophile. So notice all these guys have negative charges. They're all anionic except for um, the uh, ammonia or, the, or an amine. And uh, what's really important about the SN2 is that steric hindrance is something that will uh, uh, impact its reaction rate. So our fastest would be methyl or primary, and then anything else is uh, gonna be slower where tertiary, we actually say, is gonna be no reaction. Okay, um, so the, what is the E2 mechanism? The E2 mechanism is another attack. This time we have a strong base that is attacking, we're gonna attack the beta hydrogen, the beta proton. So this is another attack reaction. Um, and, and, that's the, and so the SN2 and E2 are the ones that are really competing in many, many cases. When do they especially compete? They especially compete when we have hydroxide and alkoxide, because you can see, maybe we can change that to a green highlight here. Hydroxide and alkoxide behave both as a strong nucleophile and a strong base. So um, I have a whole page, uh, I think it's page 17, has all the comparisons of uh, various reactions and trying to decide between SN2 and E2. So there's lots of practice problems. You can look at that. Uh, what is it gonna be based on? It's gonna be based on the sterics. It's gonna be based on the sterics of the system. Okay, if you don't have these strongly basic or strongly nucleophilic uh, conditions, then we're looking at options that are unimolecular multi-step reactions. Uh, just one component is in the rate determining step because in that step, we are losing our leaving group to make a carbocation. So these are the reactions that involve carbocations. That's the SN1 and the E1. Uh, so here we don't have any strong nucleophile, strong base. Here we usually have something uh, <clears throat> like an alcohol or water uh, as, our, as, as our nucleophile or our base, um, we call that solvolysis. When we, when we do an SN1 mechanism, we do a substitution of an alcoholide using a, a water or an alcohol solvent. Uh, and, and how do we decide if it's gonna be a good or a fast SN1 E1? That means what we need is a, more, is a very stable carbocation. So we see these reactions primarily when we have benzylic, allylic, or tertiary centers. Uh, and they're gonna be much less likely uh, if we have primary or methyl. <clears throat> so, so let's take a look at, with that approach, let's see if we can make some decisions here on what reaction mechanism we are expecting. So in this first one, we have uh, cyanide as our reagent. So that sodium, of course, tells me I have an ionic species. So cyanide, what do you think about cyanide? Acid base, electrophile, nucleophile, right? What do we have? Here, negatively charged, it is a strong nucleophile. It is a strong nucleophile. And it is, is it also a strong base? It is not because that negative charge is on a sp hybridized carbon. It's pretty, it's fairly stable. So this is a weak base. So this is an example where um, we're definitely going bimolecular because we have some strong reactivity uh, if we can. And let's take a look at our uh, leaving group. Our leaving group is on what kind of carbon? It's on a secondary 
uh, carbon. And in fact, you'll see most of the cases here we're dealing with secondary because those are really the trickiest ones to, to work on. So that's why I wanted to uh, get lots of examples modeling that. So what mechanism do you expect with a, with a strong nucleophile on a secondary substrate that looks like an SN2 mechanism? SN2, we're going to uh, expect backside attack, backside attack. Okay, let's, uh, uh, and we can go ahead and draw the product. I think I have room here. I didn't give much room, uh, but now backside attack means that we get inversion of stereochemistry, inversion of stereochemistry. So since our leaving group is a wedge, that cyanide group nucleophiles to come in from back, from behind, and we get uh, the dashed nucleophile. All right, so tell me about T-butoxide. What do you think about T-butoxide? This is now a strong base. And remember that T-butyl group is very, very large. This is a strong, bulky base. So that means it's gonna, with it, when we have sterics, that means it's gonna be very poor at doing an SN2. This is really the perfect reagent for doing an E2 elimination, an E2 elimination, because it's a strong base and it has sterics, which means uh, E2 will be favored over SN2. So the decision we have to make here when we're doing an E2 elimination is uh, which beta hydrogen do we pick? We have a hydrogen over here. We have hydrogens over here. Which, which beta proton do we select? And when it's a bulky base like TB toxide, rather than get the Zaitsev product, the more substituted product, what we get is the Hoffman product. <clears throat> We call this Hoffman elimination. That means the less substituted alkene is the one that's going to be uh, uh, our major product. E2 elimination. Okay, in our next case, we have a primary leaving group. So this one's a little different from all the others. So we have a primary leaving group. And how about our reagent? We have ethoxide. Ethoxide is one of those special cases here where we uh, it, it's both a good nucleophile and a strong base. So this is one of our trickiest ones because we have two good mechanisms to consider. It's a strong nucleophile, meaning the SN2 is possible, and it's a strong base, meaning what the E2 is possible. So we have a direct competition between both of our bimolecular uh, uh, reactions mechanisms. This is getting attacked. We just don't know uh, how it's going to be attacked. How do we decide that? We decide that based on sterics, based on sterics. So uh, if, if the SN2 can happen, it will happen. So if there's no steric hindrance, as we see in this case with the primary leaving group, right, that has very minimal sterics, that's, a, that's the best situation we could have, then we expect the SN2 to take place, SN2. So where we had the chloride, we will now have an ethoxy group. Uh, and there's no stereochemistry to show in this case because it's not occurring at a chiral center. So substitution is favored over elimination because it's a primary leaving group. Okay, all of our remaining examples are secondary. Okay, so let's uh, let's so that means you know kind of all mechanisms are fair game; they're all possible here. So how do we decide which one is going to happen? We have to look at the reactivity of our um, reagent. So tell me about hydroxide. What do you think about hydroxide? Negative charge, strong nucleophile, which means it will do an SN2 and base which means it could do an E2, hydroxide, alkoxide. All of these are our strong SN2, E2 competitions, SN2, E2. So now when we look at secondary, st secondary does have steric hindrance, which means the SN2 slows down and what takes over? E2 takes over. So the only case where the SN2 is gonna win is when it's primary. Every other example, secondary, tertiary, uh, you know, when you have any sort of sterics, the SN2 loses. So this is going to be E2. Again, we have to decide which proton are we going to take. We could get two possible elimination products. And because in this case, we do not have a bulky base, we have an ordinary base, the major product is going to be what's described as the Zaitsev 
elimination. That means we're going to get the more substituted product, the more stable product, and that means we're going to go for the more uh, the the more the proton coming from the more substituted carbon. So remember, we're losing H and Br. This is called a dehydrohalogenation reaction or E2 elimination, and uh, in this case, we're going to get the most stable alkene, and E2 is favored over S and 2 because it's secondary. Okay, what does our next example look like? Now we have methanol, uh, ethanol. Excuse me. This is this is not this is not an ionic compound. This is a covalent molecule. So the, I don't have any charges. That makes this all of a sudden a weak nucleophile and a weak base. So what happens there? Not a bimolecular reaction. We're not having anything getting attacked here. Instead, our leaving group is just going to leave. This means that we have. These are the conditions for carbocation. In other words, SN1E1. Okay, and in most cases, the SN1 is going to be favored uh, because we have a nucleophile. If you didn't have a nucleophile, like in the alcohol dehydration reaction, you would expect E1 to be major. But I would, I would guess uh, you can, you can say that both are going to happen, um, plus E1. But uh, I would expect the substitution uh, again. Temperature will have a factor here, so the exa exact experimental conditions um, are going to be at play. But uh, let's take a look at the SN1 product. We'll look at both. We'll look at both because uh, we don't know exactly what's going to be major. So if this was the SN1, the nucleophile we're going to have at the end. Remember, this is called solvolysis. The SN1 is called solvolysis reaction with our solvent. And so when we do that, remember we have to lose, we're gonna lose this proton as our last step of our mechanism. And so what do we have in place of the bromine? We have an ethoxy group. Now, what is the stereochemistry? The stereochemistry is gonna be racemization. In other words, I'm going to get both R and S product. I'm going to get the product where the uh, ethoxy group is on a wedge, and I'm going to get the product where my ethoxy group is. I'll just I'll write it out. CH two CH three is on a dash. Remember that's called a racemic mixture or a racemate. Both enantiomers. The SN one uh, uh, proceeds with racemization if it's occurring at a chiral center. Okay, and what would the E1 product look like uh, if we're going to get some of that. Well, I'm, we'll most certainly get some of that, at least as a minor product. Um, we're going to uh, get the, there's only one beta uh, proton, type of beta proton here. There's only one reasonable alkene uh, product to draw. We would get the trans as the most stable. Uh, that would that would be the, the alkene we would expect if we're going to do an E1 path. Remember, the E1 and the S1 both go through the same carbocation intermediate. By the way, this is not only secondary, it's also benzylic. It's secondary and benzylic. So this is a really good carbocation because it's next to a benzene ring it would be resonance stabilized. So that looks great. Okay, last but not least, what about um, an amine? An amine is a strong nucleophile, loves, loves, loves to do the backside attack, but it's just a weak base. So when we see uh, an amine, even though it's neutral, remember this is our one exception to our to our strong nucleophiles. When we look at that list of all of our strong nucleophiles for the SN2, you see they're all negatively charged except for the amines here, except for the amines, and that's okay. Great nucleophile. So what is that going to look like when it uh, when it attacks? We do our backside attack, and uh, we're going to invert our chiral center again. So I'm going to get a dash here. And this nitrogen has two hydrogens and and a uh, and a methyl, and that's still there, which means that's now going to have a positive charge. So this is going to be a cation in the in the product. The ammonium uh, uh, group is the ammonium ion is going to be our product. Okay, and you can leave it like that. Or you could say, hey, if I have an excess of the amine, sometimes your reaction uh, conditions will specify that. 
if I had an excess of the amine, I could actually deprotonate with that second equivalent of the, of the amine and uh, get to the neutral product instead. So NH, uh, let's draw it like this. And HCH3. So I could get the neutral amine product or I get the ammonium product. Either one of those is fine. Okay, so just a little sampling of uh, SN2, SN1, E1, E2, E1, <laughs> E1, E2. Um, but really, I think this is the biggest uh, initial distinction is uh, what, you know, do we have something that's going to be E2, SN2 type conditions or E1, SN1 type conditions? Notice I didn't pay attention to the solvent in any of these cases. I didn't even list the solvent if there was a solvent um, because your decision really can be made without considering the solvent in almost all the cases. Um, but we will look at uh, we'll, we'll look at solvents in, in another um, in another video to, to get a complete picture there. OK, and how can we apply these mechanisms to synthetic uh, to syntheses of target molecules? So we use the abbreviation TM to represent a target molecule. So if my target molecule was this alkene, how do I make this? Well, we use this special retrosynthetic arrow. Uh, that arrow means a retrosynthesis. And what this arrow is asking is what starting materials um, uh, do I need? Like what, what were the, what were the um, initial reactant substrates that I had that I converted into the alkene? And so we learned that you could do an elimination reaction to make an alkene. So if this was an E2, we could have started with an alkyl halide, right? You need a good leaving group to do an E2. So you could think about um, either putting the halide at this position, or you could put the halide at this position. So at either position of the double bond, if I had either of these alkenes and I did an E2, let's say, um, I could get the target molecule, but one of these is actually better than the other. Can you see which of these Starting materials is the better choice. Think about predicting the product now. If I, treat, if I treated this with a strong base, we have a beta hydrogen in two different positions. This would actually give a mixture of two alkene products. So that is bad news. That's not good for a synthesis because in a synthesis, we want to hopefully have one major product. And uh, this would not be able to distinguish between um, those two beta protons. So I would get two major products here. Where in the other case, if I deprotonated on either position, they would both lead to the target molecule. Okay, so then the only question is, what are my reagents? If we've been working with our flashcards where we have missing reagents, those transform flashcards, we have had a lot of practice with this. So what do you, how do you, how do you get a, a, an E2 mechanism to take place? What do we need? For an E2, we need a strong base, a strong base to come in. Now, in this case, there's only one type of beta proton to pick. So it doesn't matter which base we use, they would all work uh, and they would all give uh, E2 as the major. But maybe if we use TB toxide, if we use kind of a bulky base, then that would minimize the SN2 uh, competition. And so that might be that might be the best one here. So that would be a good synthesis of our target molecules to take one, two, three, four bromo, five, six, seven, four bromoheptane and treat it with T-butoxide. Okay, now this other one, we actually have uh, quite a few choices. We can, again, retrosynthesis, say one starting material can be an alkyl halide. And so once again, we could decide, well, I could put the bromine at this position or I could put the bromine at this position. Right, so my leaving group is no longer in the product, so I don't know exactly where it was in the starting material, and you get to pick that. A lot of times with these synthesis problems, there may be more than one correct answer. So, uh, so keep that in mind when you're checking the solutions, uh, when when you're uh, when you're checking your work. Okay, so I could have started with these um, alkyl halides. Now, in these cases, we actually have. More, we have two different, each of these would give two possible alkene products. So we want to make sure to get the one that we, that is desired. And um, because this is a very, very stable, a highly substituted, right? This would be like the Zaitsev product. This is uh, highly substituted. So what does that mean? That means if I would, I if, if would TB toxide work here? 
If I use T-butoxide on this bromide, would that give the target molecule? No, that would give that would give the double bond the less substituted double bond in this direction. So I wouldn't want to use T-butoxide, but any other base that I pick is going to be great here. Remember, on a secondary alkyl halide, uh, it's uh, it's going to be favored over SN2. So we could use something like sodium ethoxide or methoxide or hydroxide. Your choice. Any strong base. Okay. And so actually, this one might be a little better because it's a tertiary leaving group. So now there, there's no way I'm going to have SN2. So this might even be a better choice. Um, so what would I use here? T-butoxide again. Can't use T-butoxide because that would give the less substituted product. That would give the alkene in this direction. So any other base, methoxide, ethoxide, propoxide. What's what's your what's your what's your fa favorite here, right? Um, uh, MeOnA. So we could use sodium methoxide or or hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. Anything you want. There's so many different choices here. So don't get hung up on. Oh my gosh, I selected this and. This one used a different one because any base will do, any strong base. We just want to avoid the bulky base because we have to get the Zetef product. Okay, and actually because this is such a stable alkene, this is a stable alkene that's tri-substituted, um, we can actually use alcohol dehydration in this example as well because that always gives the Zetef product. So what does that mean? Another possible starting material would be the alcohol, would be the alcohol. So if I started with an alcohol, again, a tertiary center would be, would be great because alcohol dehydration is the reaction I'm trying to do here. Alcohol dehydration goes by an E1 mechanism. And uh, so a tertiary substrate would be ideal, right? Because a tertiary carbocation is great. So this would be a very fast uh, or, or, or you know, very doable uh, dehydration. And so how do you do it? Dehydration. What is that? Um, remember, in each of these cases, I'm I'm making my target molecule here. Um, how do I uh, do a dehydration? I need to turn that OH into a good leaving group. So what I use is a super super strong acid. Uh, so something like concentrated H2SO4. And typically, I throw in some heat as well to favor that elimination. That's going to lose water. That's going to lose water, and that's going to give me just so we could draw it again here. That's gonna give me the most stable alkene possible, Zaitsev elimination. So look at this, for this target molecule, there's three good starting materials that we could start from. All of those would be successful. These tertiary substrates are probably the best because they don't have any uh, competition with, uh, with substitution uh, uh, mechanism uh, uh, as well. So, so that's just uh, uh, lots, of, lots of textbook problems, no doubt for you to work on to get practice in in doing these substitution versus elimination and also in uh, doing synthesis problems. But that's always a great capstone. That's always a great way to wrap up a unit is think, thinking, how can we apply these new mechanisms to working on synthetic problems? All right, good luck with your organic chemistry. I'll see you later.